Uh, so my name is uh, Dr. Joanna Helmuth. I'm a neurologist here at the Memory and Aging Center, and I'm going to speak uh, this morning about non-evidence-based treatments for dementia and brain health. So this is a very broad topic. Am I getting messages that you can't hear? Too much? Is that better? Is that good? Yes. Okay, I'll speak very close here. Um, so, so the topic of non-evidence-based treatments is a very broad one. And so what I really wanted to focus on today was helping you decode some of these direct-to-consumer products that are put out there for promoting brain health and preventing dementia. So these can be supplements, they can be other interventions, they can be protocols that claim to uh, prevent uh, cognitive decline or reverse cognitive decline if it's there. And the goal is really to give you tools to help decode some of these products so when you're out there in the world you have a better sense of what those labels actually mean and you feel like you understand as much as the companies do who are putting those out there. So I think it's very challenging to know what to trust when you look at some of these products. Again, there's a lot of supplements, as Dr. Casaletto mentioned. Uh, there's even kind of blood therapies that are out there for a mere $8,000. Um, you can get some young blood transfused into you. Uh, there's a very kind of uh, uh, titillating book title out there called The End of Alzheimer's Disease, a program to prevent and reverse cognitive decline. And when you look at some of these claims, they're actually quite bold. And uh, they can evoke a lot of hope and promise for people who are worried about their brain health or in a situation where they already are experiencing cognitive decline. And so again, I want to kind of give you some understanding about what are the laws in, in the United States um, for what people can put on these labels so that you really understand how to decode them. So first I'm going to talk about supplements because supplements I think is one of the biggest questions that we get in our neurology clinic at the Memory and Aging Center. So um, how does the government actually regulate these supplements? So this is really dictated by um, an act of Congress in 1994, which is called the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. So this act really dictates how the FDA can regulate the safety and the efficacy of supplements that you see on you know, in the drugstore or in the grocery store. And the, and the point that I'll keep coming back to is safety and efficacy. Again, we want you to um, be taking things that are safe and we know that they have some efficacy behind them. They have some data to suggest that they work. So let's talk about safety for a moment. So I think a lot of people are surprised to realize that the FDA is not allowed by this act of Congress to test any supplements for safety before they appear on the market. And so um, uh, they may say that they include certain things, and they may say that they're safe, and I would hope that they are. But all it takes is one unscrupulous company who goes for the cheap stuff instead of the high quality things that it doesn't include contaminants, and no one can test for that. Also, I think it's interesting to know how the government regulates safety of these supplements. So supplements are considered safe until proven otherwise. So they actually need to cause harm before they're considered unsafe, which is troubling because there's actually a fairly high burden of what's unsafe. So the FDA is only permitted by this act to stop a company from making a supplement until it can prove that it poses a significant public health risk. So it's actually a fairly high burden of being unsafe before these supplements can be pulled from the market which I think is troubling. I think a lot of people assume that the government has more regulation of this than they do. And I want to point out that this is really kind of the opposite of how the FDA regulates prescription drugs. So we actually have to prove that these prescription drugs are safe. Even kind of over-the-counter drugs, we have to prove they're safe before people have access to them. But for the supplement industry, it's entirely different. So I think that some of the things that people may not realize is that these supplement manufacturers are allowed to kind of market supplements as kind of being safe and natural. There's often a lot of kind of labeling that occurs to say, that, you know, this is a natural herbal supplement. Uh, and that may be true, but we do not have any data to know that that's true because, again, we don't know what's in them and, and the FDA doesn't know what's in them either. They may contain hazardous compounds. Um, these supplements may um, cause side effects, they may cause unwanted symptoms, and they may interact with other drugs that you're taking or medical conditions you have. Again, we don't know. I'm not saying that supplements are harmful. I'm just saying we don't know that they're not. We have no data to prove one way or the other what's going on. 
So as far as efficacy, I think people often wonder what's behind those bold claims on labels. And you know, at the Memory and Aging Center, we've reviewed all of this data very thoroughly, and we know that no dietary supplement has been shown to prevent cognitive decline or dementia. So kind of keep that in mind as we kind of move forward and try to dissect what's on some of these labels. So how is it that we see these labels with bold claims if we know that no dietary supplement has been shown to prevent cognitive decline or dementia? Well, under the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994, supplement manufacturers are allowed to make claims about structure and function of the, of the human body. So they're allowed to make claims like calcium can improve bone strength because that is a commentary on the structure of the human body, the strength of bones. These supplement manufacturers are also allowed legally to make claims about function of the human body. So things like Supplement X can improve your memory or your concentration. Memory and concentration are normal things that the human brain does, and supplement manufacturers are allowed to make claims about these normal functions that the body does. I think the question is, what is, what is the data behind that? So the FDA does not see or review any data that these claims are true, prior to these supplements coming on the market. And actually, these companies are supposed to have data that's backing them, but the FDA is not permitted to even ask for it. So it's a little bit of kind of the fox guarding the hen house situation going on here. And so I think, you know, it's fair to question, um, how well is the system working? How well is this kind of self-regulation model working? And the Department of Health and Human Services asked that very question back in 2012. So they examined 127 supplements and they said, we just want to kind of look into these claims that some of these supplement manufacturers are making and see if there's actually the data behind them that they claim is behind them. And they found that it was very inconsistent with the FDA guidance on having competent and reliable scientific evidence. And a government entity says that we really doubt that these structure function claims are truthful and they're not misleading the public. At the same time, these are the laws that we have in our country, so this is really a federal issue. Until these claims are, um, are regulated better by the federal government, they will continue. Again, these structure function claims are perfectly legal. So if that's legal, what is actually crossing the line into an illegal claim on some of these supplement labels? So um, supplement manufacturers cannot make claims about preventing, treating, or curing a disease process. So supplement manufacturers cannot say things like supplement X can improve Alzheimer's symptoms or Alzheimer's disease because that's making a claim about preventing, treating, or curing a disease. And really, once a manufacturer makes that kind of claim, it crosses the line and actually um, supplements are then considered drugs. And so then they're kind of regulated by the whole set of laws that uh, kind of govern what happens to drugs. So it's a bit of a fine line in how these statements are perceived. So a statement like clinically proven to improve memory, which appears on this label here, perfectly legal, company doesn't have to provide any evidence to the FDA that's true, and who knows what would happen if we actually looked at that data. That's legal, but you're not allowed to say clinically proven to improve Alzheimer's disease. And I would argue that most people, when they're in the grocery store at the pharmacy looking at those labels, can't really discern the difference between those two statements. If you've got a loved one with Alzheimer's disease who has memory problems and you see a label that says clinically proven to improve memory, I think most people would assume that that would help for the condition of Alzheimer's disease. But again, we don't have to, they don't have to provide any evidence that that's true. But the FDA can act on that second claim and say this is illegal, we need to pull you off the market. So I want to kind of go through a quick exercise of how we interpret this label now. So if you kind of look initially here, uh, they make some claims natural, kind of sounds like a natural product, probably safe for me, probably doesn't have any hazardous compounds in it, I don't know. For a sharper mind, that's a functional claim about the brain, legally allowed to make it, don't have to have any evidence provided to the FDA, that's true. Extra strength, 
I don't know what normal strength is. I don't know what the tests are behind that, but it sounds like I should probably pay 10 or more dollars more than it would for the regular strength. Um, clinically proven to improve memory and concentration. We've gone through this. This is a structural claim. Allowed to make that claim legally. Don't have to provide any data to prove that. Same for the next statement. Enhances mental agility by improving focus, learning, and attention. Again, we do not know the data behind that, and they may or may not have that. Stimulant-free. I hope it's not, but is there any evidence to prove that it's not? And results in four weeks. Again, we don't know that there's any clinical evidence backing this. And I want to point out that these supplements are not inexpensive. So I, this is just one that I found. This was not even the most expensive one on the shelf that day. Um, but this is just for one month's treatment. And so I think, um, considering some of the interventions that Dr. Casaletto was mentioning earlier, do you want to spend your money on this or do you want to spend your money on something with evidence behind it that probably isn't going to hurt you? And again, this may not hurt you, but we don't know one way or the other. So Dr. Miller, Dr. Rabinovich, and I were a little disturbed by the field and what's been going on. We see a lot of these supplements on the market. We're very frequently asked about this in our clinic. And so we wrote a paper that came out in a pretty major medical journal, the Journal of American Medical Association, back in January. And we really labeled this pseudomedicine. We said, you know, these claims are unethical in some way. They're making uh, claims where they're not data backing them, and somebody's making money off of that. And so we really labeled that practice pseudomedicine. We just wanted more people talking about it, so people would point it out and not try to dismiss it and say, ah, oh, probably won't hurt you. If you've got the extra 20 bucks, that's probably fine. May or may not hurt you, we don't know. Interestingly, about two weeks after our paper came out, the FDA came out with very bold warnings about Alzheimer's disease supplements and the dangers that they may carry. This was covered by the New York Times and many other ma uh, major news sources. And I just want to kind of break down if uh, what the FDA action really did. So again, we don't know that it's related to our paper, but it's certainly temporally correlated to our paper. <laughs> Anyways, so the FDA said that they sent warnings to 17 supplement manufacturers, they're kind of pictured here, um, because they made um, illegal claims about uh, preventing, treating, or curing Alzheimer's disease. These were strongly worded, and they had actually a very great consumer warning that they put out. They use bold language. These fly in the face of true science. These, these are offered by scam artists. These products are a waste of money. The FDA is saying this. And this is a little bit more of a conservative FDA commissioner, actually. I think what's interesting, though, is that they were only targeting the companies that were making these illegal claims about preventing, treating, or curing Alzheimer's disease. All these supplements still perfectly legal, and I don't want to point these out as bad actors because there's many, many more, but um, there's a lot of supplements that are perfectly legal that can make very misleading claims that are out there. So the FDA is very limited in the way that they can act based on the federal laws that are currently in place. I just have a few minutes left, but I want to talk about the next thing that we as neurologists are asked most often about, which is the Bredesen Protocol. So you may or may not have heard this, but uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen put out a book in 2017 claiming that he had developed the first program to prevent and reverse cognitive decline. It's a pretty bold claim, um, but I think a lot of people have been very excited in the field. You know, As others have mentioned, there's a lot of modifiable things that we can do that can influence brain health. So what is the protocol? It talks a about a lot of these lifestyle interventions. Um, also talks a lot about um, different supplements um, that are recommended. Let me go back to that. Um, that are thought to perhaps promote brain health. Um, this has since been modified and they're actually look at kind of infectious causes of cognitive changes. So things like chronic Lyme disease or other things that could be involved. So I am a... Uh, neurologist, but I'm also a scientist, so I am asked by scientific journals to review papers and in the peer review process. And through that, I go through papers and I decide what's good quality and what needs to be changed. Should the um, editors of the journal accept the paper or should they reject it because it doesn't meet the standards? And so I wanted to share with you some of my thoughts of breaking down the three scientific papers that are out there on Dr. Bredesen's work. And this is just my opinion of what I've looked at. I think the big picture is that he um, reports what we call case reports or case series, where he describes 
what he or other providers have seen in patients. So these are descriptive studies. It's like saying, I saw five bluebirds in my backyard today. Doesn't mean that there weren't 10 blackbirds, a possum, and a raccoon, but there were five bluebirds that I saw in my backyard today. I think the important thing to note is that these case series are uh, non-analytically designed studies. They're not designed to test hypotheses, so there is not a paper out there in the literature that tests the hypothesis whether the Bredesen protocol will reverse cognitive decline or prevent dementia. We don't have that data yet. I'll also point out that these three papers don't have a method section. So method section is a traditional part of a scientific paper that describes what was done, how was it done, so that other people can replicate this. And these papers don't include that. So we don't really know what participants were included or excluded or why. We don't really know what was done with these individuals because the protocol's very broad. So they say, it's personalized. Everyone got something different which may be what's needed for people, but we don't know what they did or what they didn't do. I can say that I have a patient who did the Bredesen protocol and he never exercised because he didn't want to. Um, and as we know that that can be one of the, the main variables that can really influence brain health. And kind of going back to this hypothesis testing, again, there was no control group, there was no randomization. And Dr. Lubenko will talk a little bit next about kind of what we look for in clinical trials to really be able to evaluate whether something works. So in my personal opinion, these are low quality studies. I would not have suggested that the editors accept them into the journals, but they were accepted and they're out there for people to evaluate. And I think one of the questions is, how did these studies get accepted into scientific journals? Well, um, it has been commented that the two journals that he's published his papers in are considered by some to be predatory open access journals. So um, these are journals um, where, so if you don't know what an open access journal is, this is where a scientist pays for their paper to be published, but under, you know, for good reason. So that can be accessible to everyone. And so it's not just to people who have a subscription to that paper. So there's actually very good open access journals out there. But predatory open access journals actually hijack this model for profit. So they charge a very high fee, often thousands of dollars, for your paper to get published. And there's very low editorial oversight over what happens. And so it can really evaluate the quality of some of these papers that get through. I think the other part that's concerning to me personally is the financial conflicts of interest that are not disclosed. So Dr. Bredesen came out with this um, book in 2017, and the last paper that he published on his protocol was in 2018. And there was no comment in that paper about having any financial conflicts of interest. I don't know how well this book did, but I'm guessing it did pretty well because it was on the New York Times bestsellers list for quite some time. Also was on the Amazon bestsellers list, still is listed on that, and is on the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list. People really love this book. Um, and so um, I think that has a lot of popular appeal. It makes a very broad claim. And I'm just a little bit worried when I see someone promoting something that has pretty low quality science, and I have a sense that they might be making money off of this. I think additionally, Dr. Bredesen is listed as chief scientific officer of a company based here in California that is promoting this protocol, where for about um, $1,400, you can get all the blood tests for um, the protocol, and they can recommend a provider for you and kind of help cultivate the process. Doesn't pay for any of the supplements are actually going through the protocol, but again, it's an undisclosed financial conflict of interest, and I'm always a little bit concerned where I um, see people not being totally forthright about all their potential motivations. So what can you do? One, understand that supplements may not be safe for you. They might be safe for you, but we, again, we just don't have data one way or the other about their safety. Know that supplement manufacturers can make very broad claims about improving brain functioning, and they don't have to provide any evidence that that's true or that that's the case. I would say, you know, use the information that you're learning here to empower not only yourselves, but your friends and your family about these issues, because the reality is all we have is us and our voices passing this message around. The supplement manufacturers have a lot of money, and they have a lot of reason to promote their side of things, but I want people to really feel empowered to make whatever good choices for you. 
And I think also, you know, if you're considering one of these other non-evidence-based treatments, consider the interventions that other people have mentioned today that we know do have evidence behind them. And maybe instead of spending your resources, your time and your money on some of these supplements or other things, really make sure that you're maximizing what you can get out of those other interventions that we know have efficacy. So if you want to learn more, we have a few papers that are out at the front. I think we have copies of that JAMA article in case you want to read it. Um, there was an interview on KQED Forum a few weeks ago that I did, and so here's the website for that if you want to listen to that. Honestly, I think we go a little bit more in depth today than we do in that interview. Um, but again, I think that this is an important issue, and really until the federal laws are changed, it's going to be very tough for people to um, be able to set what's out there. So I really appreciate uh, you come in today and hopefully you'll have some great questions for us later. Take care.